quick primitives like hash functions or encryption schemes are critical parts in most security systems in the sense that if the crypto primitive is broken, then the security of the whole system collapses. But the paradox, this happens very rarely. And actually, as we heard in Diego's talk just before the break, then most attacks do not exploit some cryptographic weaknesses. Instead, they exploit some flaws in the implementation or in the protocol. And so this is why I agree with Adi Shamil, one of the inventors of the RSA. He said that he was not aware of any major world-class security system employing cryptography in which the hackers penetrated the system by actually going through the cryptanalysis. So as a cryptographer, I have to say that it's very nice to belong to this very small group of people who never fail, because <laughs> we are doing such a great job, we, we are designing very secure primitive. Well, <laughs> perfection. <laughs> well, this is not the only thing that we share with this guy. Well, also in a very few situations, Cryptography has caused some disasters. So if you look carefully at all recent attacks against TLS, for instance, you will observe that some of them are due to some flow in the cryptographic primitives. None of these three attacks, for instance, would have been possible without breaking some crypto. Another major disaster caused by cryptography is this MIFR contactless card, which has been developed by an XP. So 10 billions of this chip have been sold. It has been used in most major transportation networks, and it has been severely broken because it uses a very bad encryption algorithm. So when you see the list of all these primitives which have been broken, sometimes only a few months after they have been proposed, then you can legitimately wonder whether cryptographers can be trusted. And so this is a question I would like to address in my talk. And more precisely, I would like to identify a few situations where cryptographers can be trusted. And so the very first situation is a case where cryptographers say that a primitive is broken. Then trust them and don't use it. Well, even in this simple situation, it's not so easy to trust cryptographers because everybody knows that those guys are paranoid. And this is true. Well, we are paranoid. Well, let's look at this example. So this is a paper which has been published last month, but this is a nice paper and I could have chosen any other example. So this paper presents a cryptanalysis of spritz. Spritz is a string cipher which has been designed by Ron Rivers in order to replace RC4. And so the authors of this paper, they say that they present this cryptanalysis of, of spritz and they say that spritz can be broken because its internal state can be recovered after 2 to the power 1247 operations. Well, nice. Well, 2 to the power 1247, but that's a lot. Well, actually, that's significantly more than the estimated number of atoms in the universe raised to the fourth. So, <laughs> Does it really make sense to say that this cipher is broken? Well, it depends on what we mean by broken. And what cryptographer means by broken is that the primitive does not have an ideal behavior. And so an ideal behavior means that the primitive behaves like a function which has been randomly chosen from the set of all functions having the same parameters. So if we come back to spritz, it must behave like a randomly chosen function which takes as input a 1730-bit secret initialization and then generates a long sequence. For any such function, what we can always do to attack the function is try all possible values for the initial state and then compare the results with the sequence that we have observed. But this brute force technique is the best we can do if the function has been randomly chosen. While for spritz, we can do much better because we are able to recover the state within to the power 1247 operations. So we have an algorithm for recovering the states which is faster than the best generic algorithm. And this is exactly what broken means for a cryptographer. 
So let's take another example. So a cryptographic hash function is a function which takes as input any binary data and which outputs an unbit value. So this hash value is usually used in order to detect whether the input data has been manipulated or not. So this means that what an attacker usually wants to do in this setting is modifying the data without changing the hash value. So in other words, he wants to solve the following problem. Given some original message m, he wants to find a second message, m prime, which has the same hash value as m. And so if the hash function has been randomly chosen, then the best thing he can do consists in picking some random messages until he finds one which has the right hash value. And because there are two to the n possible hash values, then he needs to choose on average two to the n different random messages until he finds a good one. But in some of our applications, the attacker is facing up a slightly different problem, which is the search for collisions. So now the attacker wants to find two messages, m and m prime, which have the same hash value, but now there is no requirement anymore on this hash value. And then the best algorithm for doing this, if the hash function has been randomly chosen, consists in selecting 2 to the n over 2 random messages. So this is much easier. And so I, as a cryptographer, I will consider as broken any hash function for which one of these two problems can be solved faster than these generic techniques. And so as you can see here, of course, finding collisions is much easier than finding second pre-images. Well, this is easy to understand. If I want to find someone in the audience who has the same birthday as me, then I will have to select, on average, 365 people. But if I want to find two people with the same birthday, a group of 23 people on average will be enough. So that's much easier. And so this explains why most attacks against hash function are collision attacks. So for instance, MD5 and SHA-1 have been broken, but this is because we are able to find some collisions for this function faster than what is expected from their output size. But we do not know any algorithm for finding second images for those hash functions. And so this is why it is widely believed that MD5 and SHA-1 are still secure in some application because those applications need only a hash function for which finding second pre-images is difficult. And so this is why MD5 has been added as an option in TLS 1.2, for instance, because we think that collisions are not important. So this has been added in 2008, so this means four years after the first collisions have been demonstrated on MD5. But a few months ago, my colleagues at Hiria, they have mounted an attack against the protocol where they can use that finding collisions is enough. So the lesson we can learn from this is when a cryptographer presents some attack on a primitive, well, even if you think that this attack is not really relevant in your particular setting, or even if you think that this attack is not practical because it has a huge time complexity, then you should take this attack into account because attacks reveal some unexpected behavior and a behavior which has not been expected by the designers is usually a very bad sign because it often opens doors to more civil flows. And so a very good rule of thumb is that attacks always get better, they never get worse. So this is why I claimed at the very beginning that if cryptographers say that something is broken, don't use it. Well, this is the easy part. But this doesn't say now what happens when we want to choose a primitive and we would like to have some guarantee that it won't be broken in the next few days or in the next few months. So let's take an example. So we have three primitives here, VAS, which has been standardized by the American NIST, Crypto1, which is the encryption algorithm developed by NXP, and DualUC, which is a pseudo-random generator also standardized by NIST. And so nine years ago, none of these three primitives was broken. But today, the last two have been severely broken, while the first one is not. And so the question is, could we predict this? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, we could, because, because there's a huge difference between those three primitives. The difference is that the AES has been standardized after a five-year open public competition. Well, this is not the case of the other two. So this 
open public competition. This is a favorite process in cryptography for finding, defining new standards or, or recommending new crypto primitives. So there have been a lot of such competition in the last 20 years for different types of primitives. And you've probably heard of this SHA-3 competition, which has been launched by NIST in order to define the new hash function standard. So how did it work? Well, after MD5 and SHA-1 have been broken, and after some discussion about the security requirements, then NIST published a call for primitives, where they define all submission requirements. So the deadline was the end of October 2008. And then they received 64 candidates. Among these 64 candidates, 51 have been considered as valid submissions. And then all submission documents for these 51 candidates have been made public on the NIST website and also we had a huge conference where all these 51 hash functions have been presented. And then, well, and then, and then the fight begins. Yes, because when you are a submitter, the best strategy to win the competition is, of course, to break the other candidates. And so people started publishing some attacks and, of course, all of these attacks have been checked by the other designers, by the community, they have been published, and then on the website we could see this list of all submissions with some nice colors appearing depending on the time complexity of the proposed attacks. So, well, some candidates have been broken like this during the first months, and then in July 2009, 14 candidates among the 51 have been selected by NIST and have been moved forward to the second round. Then we had two large conferences discussing and analyzing the security and the performances of these 14 remaining candidates. And eventually in October 2012, so this means exactly four years after the submission deadline, NIST, NIST announced Kachak, a Belgium candidate, as the winner of the competition. And so, because we need this security evaluation, another strategy which is usually used by the designers consists in offering some prize. So here is an example taken from Ketchak website. So they say, we announce the third prize for the most interesting cryptanalysis of Ketchak. The result must be publicly available before December 5, 2009. And here comes the important point. The third prize consists of beer. This time we offer lumbic beers, so the price is a case with 24, the number of rounds in Ketchak, 24 bottles of lumbic beers. So this is really a nice motivation. And so with my colleague, Christina Bucha, we started working very hard on Ketchak and, and we won the beers. So. <laughs> So for winning the beer, what we did is that we have exhibited some distinguisher, that means some non-random behavior, not on the hash function, but on a building block of the hash function. So for detecting this non-random behavior, we needed two to the power 1574 operations, which is astronomic, but which is less than what is expected for a random permutation. So this is not an attack against the hash function because it only applies to the inner permutation, not to the whole hash function, and nobody succeeded so far in turning, in turning it into an attack against the hash function. So when we are not able to attack the whole function, what we usually do is that we try to attack what we call reduced version of the function. Because most hash functions or block ciphers, they consist of many iterations of a simple function. So for instance, Ketchak, well, which is now SHA-3, it consists of 24 iterations of this simple function. And so a natural question is to determine how many rounds we can attack. And so for Ketchak, the best we can do is find collision on five rounds of the function, five out of the 24 rounds of the original function. If we look at AES, which has been standardized after a similar open competition, AES consists of 10 rounds. And so some attacks again on five and six rounds have been published by the designers themselves in the submission document. Then during the competition in 2000, this, the attack against six rounds has been improved and then a kind of attack, well, 
with astronomy complexity has been also proposed and then on, on seven rounds. And then this attack on seven rounds, it has been improved and improved by several sets of offers. And so what we can see now is that almost 20 years after the submission of AES, then we are only able to attack seven rounds out of the 10 rounds of the function. So this is a very good security argument. This is a quite convincing demonstration of a good security margin. Now, conversely, if some, some cryptographic primitive does not benefit from such a public analysis, then there's no reason to trust it. So if we think about this crypto one developed by NXP, then this was a proprietary design. So the specification were kept secret. So this is a typical situation that when, where there's no reason to trust the primitive. More interestingly, this Simon and Speck, these are two block ciphers which have recently proposed, been proposed by the NSA that's dedicated to uh, low-cost devices. And they are really pushing for standardization. But they published the specification, but without any design rationale, without any security analysis. So in this situation, well, I don't see why we should trust these block ciphers. And I don't see why they should be standardized. So, and this will be my conclusion, is there anything to be learned from cryptographer? It's that public analysis is the only security argument that has to be considered. So, of course, critical thinking is something which is essential for our everyday life, and that's the same in cryptography. Cryptanalysis is essential for security. Thank you.